right? Numbers 14, verses 1 through 35. <clears throat> then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel, and Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones, but the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a, a nation greater and mightier than they. But Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear of it, for you brought up this people in your might from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people. For you, O Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands over them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill this people as one man, then the nations who have heard your fame will say, It is because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land that he swore to give to them that he has killed them in the wilderness. And now, please, let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised, saying, The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgressions. But he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers. And none of those who despise me shall see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Now, since the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valleys, turn tomorrow and set out for the wilderness by the way to the Red Sea. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, How long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord, What you have said in my hearing I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall by the wilderness, and all of your number listed in the census from twenty years old and upward who have grumbled against me. Not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, who you said would become a prey, I will bring in, and they shall know the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and shall suffer for your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, forty days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity forty years, and you shall know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely this will I do to all the wicked congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall come to a full end, and there they shall die. And God bless the reading of his word. In America, it is often supposed and taught in popular Christian 
uh, circles that once you become a Christian, all of life will pretty much fall into place. In fact, there are preachers who teach that you can have your best life right now if you begin to follow the ways of God so that basically every day can seem like your Friday, which is the day of the week that we all look forward to. In fact, Christianity is often presented in terms uh, of how God is just waiting to shower all of his blessings on you. And if you will just follow certain biblical principles in your life, you will begin to experience the abundance of God. Christian sociologist Christian Smith has identified this sort of thinking as something that has been called moralistic therapeutic deism. This is not a, an identified belief where somebody, where you ask them, hey, what are you? Oh, I'm a moralistic, therapeutic deist. Okay, it's not that kind of belief. It's just something that has been uh, sort of identified by sociologists. Now, the attributes, according to Michael Horton, uh, of moralistic, therapeutic deism are this. One, it is believed that God created the world. Pretty good so far. Okay. Two, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and most world religions. Three, the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Four, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when we need to resolve a problem. And five, good people die, or good people, when they die, they go to heaven. Now, this thinking is quite common among us today in America. Very, very common, okay? I mean, it's, it's almost right up there with, with the American dream in some ways, okay? Life is all about you. Life is all about happiness. And God is here to help you get the happiness that you want. Now, the Israelites coming out of Egypt, they carried this sort of mentality with them as they journeyed to the promised land. They thought that life was, uh, that basically they were just going to coast uh, in the salvation of God from Egypt and that everything was just going to be handed to them on a silver platter. When things didn't go their way, they were always tempted toward unbelief. When Pharaoh came chasing after the Israelites with his entire uh, army and his chariots, the people, uh, the Bible says, they feared greatly. And they began to think that their, that their redemption was basically all a sham and that God had abandoned them. That God had basically purposely brought them out there to suffer and die. The Christian life can seem like that. The Christian life, it is a redemption from slavery, uh, from slavery of sin, okay, uh, be it to addictions, uh, particular sins, be it from our own hearts, from serious sins that we have committed, uh, uh, self-righteousness, uh, doing all the right things for all the wrong reasons, okay. Uh, Christianity is deliverance from that. It is being redeemed from those sort of things. But the Christian life is not an easy life. It's not an easy life. The life of the Israelites going into and taking over the promised land was not meant to be an easy one either. It was meant, in one sense, to be one of trial and error for them. One of trial and error. One generation had reached, basically they'd reached God's point of no return, and they were left behind to perish, and they were never to see the promised land. In this sermon, we're going to look at this generation that perished. To fully understand the significance of this account in the history of redemption, we will first look at, what the account of the, uh, look at the account of the wilderness and what it signified for Israel at that time. Then, how the account served as a later witness to Israel and to the Christian church. And finally, how we can face the wilderness of our own lives with a better hope. So, let's, let's jump right in. Let's go. All right. Israel's unbelief. So, the people of Israel up to this point, uh, though having been graciously taken out of slavery, have proven that the slavery has not been taken out of them. Though they have seen the power of God and the glory of God displayed before them, uh, they've even literally had the fear of God put into them. Okay, when they saw the glory uh, displayed to them on the mountain, okay, when God spoke and, and they, they just got absolutely frightened. They didn't want God to speak to them anymore. Their hearts, however were not fundamentally changed. Their hearts were not fundamentally changed. They were still an idolatrous people. They were still a sinful people. They were still a stiff-necked people. In a sense, God had proven himself to them in the big thing, okay, the redemption, getting them out. But the people had constant trouble living in faith from day to day. 
As a result, they had complained about a great many things. Now, their grumblings go as far back uh, as shortly after they had crossed the Re uh, before they had crossed the Red Sea, okay, uh, all the way to Exodus 16. Uh, even when they complained that they had no food and God had brought them out to die, Exodus 16, 1 through 4. Then they complained about water in Exodus 17, verses 1 through 7. They were even doubting God's very presence with them at that point. They were basically like, you know, they were doing the whole Mexican thing, is God with us or not? Okay, that was basically their, their attitude. And, and, and in a sense, when times got tough for them, it was easy for them to say, God's not here. Because times are tough, therefore, God is not here, was basically their thinking. As we come into Numbers, the people are traveling further through the wilderness and heading toward their promised land. But their hearts are still hard toward God. So even after God meeting all their needs, giving them food, giving them the manna, uh, giving them water, their hearts are still hard toward God. As we see their unbelief, we will notice that we are not so far different from them. We're not that much different from them. As we see their unbelief, we'll see that we're not so different. That is to say that there are those, even among us, who profess to be Christian, and yet our daily walk is in, in the same unbelief that Israel demonstrated. It can be in the same day-to-day -day unbelief. So, let's survey some of their incidents here in the book of Numbers leading up to our current chapter, chapter 14. Okay. So, first, uh, the people of Israel, they had complained to God, about daily provision of manna in the desert. Okay, in Numbers 11, if you want to turn there, Numbers 11, verses 1 through 6, we read this. It says, And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outlying parts of the camp. Now, that's pretty scary. <laughs> that's pretty scary. God gets angry and all of a sudden this fire just basically appears out of nowhere on some of the outskirts of the camp and just starts consuming, starts consuming things, starts consuming people. Then the people cried out uh, to Moses and Moses prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. So the name of that place was called Taborah because the fire of the Lord burned among them. Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving and the people of Israel wept, wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. Now I feel bad about liking steak so much. <laughs> we remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Now, stop and think about that. They have been rescued from slavery having wiped out the Egyptians and all their wealth, okay, they took all their wealth with them, they plundered them, okay, uh, and they're complaining about, quote-unquote, misfortunes. Are you serious? <laughs> Are you serious? They're complaining about misfortunes. I mean, it, it's not like they didn't have anything to eat, okay? It's not, it, it, they just didn't have what they wanted to eat. They didn't have what they were craving some commentators have noted that this rabble, or riffraff, uh, in some of the translations, that are here complaining that they might be identified with the mixed multitudes uh, from Exodus 12.38. That is, that there were probably some Egyptians that went out with the Israelites that, all, that also uh, fled from Egypt. Now, whoever these, uh, these elitist sounding crowd is, okay, they apparently have grown dissatisfied with God's provisions and somehow they have a recollection of these delicacies that they had in Egypt, okay? So if they are these uh, uh, elite or if they are these Egyptians, you know, they're, they're missing their Egyptian food. But if it's the Israelites complaining, you have to think about this. It's like, wait, you guys were slaves, you guys were under harsh conditions and all of a sudden you remember fish, you remember meat. You remember onions, garlic, and the leeks and the melons? It's like, you know, was your slavery that good? Why, you know, but, but you guys were crying out to God for redemption. And, that, and, you know, God even told Moses, I've heard the cry of my people, and I have come down. You know, it's like it, something's just, something's not making sense here. Commentator Matthew Henry, he said this about them. He says, they magnified the plenty and the dainties that they had in Egypt as if God uh, had one of them uh, a had done them a great deal of wrong in taking them thence. 
it's Old English because he wrote in the 1700s. They remember the cucumbers, the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic, but they do not remember the brick kilns, and the taskmasters, the voice of the oppressor, and the smart of the whips. They were sick of the good provision God had made for them. They distrusted the power and the goodness of God as insufficient for their supply. Now, notice the text says that they had a quote-unquote strong craving. Matthew Henry, he also says here that this was a lustful lust. Okay, that that's a little bit closer to, to the translation in Hebrew. A lustful lust. This is near akin to the language that's used in the Bible for idolatry. It's pretty much the same words that are used to describe or to call out what idols are, okay? Which is basically an inordinate desire. The Greek word that is used in the New Testament is epithemeo, which is to say an over-desire, okay? Whenever you overly desire something, that's also the same word that's used to call an idol an idol, or to call lust. One could almost say with Augustine that our idols are the things that we desire more than we desire God. Augustine said that sin is really just misplaced love. Sin is misplaced love. Whenever you love something more than God, when you've rearranged the loves in your life and something goes into the slot where God's supposed to go in, Augustine said, that's sin. That's what sin is. It's just misplaced love. Idolatry happens when we love anything more than we love God. Their lust for the foods of Egypt over God's provision uh, of manna, which was called the grain of heaven in Psalm 78, 24, it, it blinded them to the provision of God. They were blind by their, by their own lustful lust, their over-desires. They were blinded to the provisions that God had already provided for them. Now, does this remind you of the temptation in the garden? Remember that God had given all of creation to Adam and Eve, but he restricts one tree, and all of a sudden, God was the bad guy. God has restored, he has restored freedom and given identity to these people, but they miss the old food. They miss the old food, and all of a sudden, God is no longer a great provider because they're looking back on their old life. They're looking back at their life in slavery. And so we ask, what do we still crave from our old lifestyles that draws our hearts back too? What do we still crave? What do we still miss? What do we look back and say, man, if, you know, if only I could still do this, if only I could still do that. Man, if things were a little bit different. You know, for the people here, it was the pleasures of food. But pleasures, they come in many different packages. They come in many different forms. It could be the sensuality of sex, the power of money, the appeal of manipulating beauty, the comfort of a lucrative career and advancement, the security of self-righteousness, perhaps even the straight-up worship of self. The straight-up worship of self. What's absent from our own lives that makes us doubt the goodness of God? We have to ask that question. What's absent? What are we missing that, that we doubt the goodness of God, that we doubt God's good provision for us? What do we think that we need from God that would just complete our lives? What do we think that we're missing? In another place, the people grumble against the power of God. So first, it's the, the provision of God. But in another place, in number 13, they, they grumble against the power of God to be able to give them what he has promised. Okay, can God, does God have the ability to come through with what he's promised? In Numbers 13, the spies are sent into the land to do basically reconnaissance work. When they return, they report that the land, it's a good and fertile land, but there's a big problem, okay? The people who are currently inhabiting the land are bigger and stronger than they are. They are described as the sons of Anak, who were the giants. Uh, they call them giants in the sense, or they were of giant proportions, okay, however tall they were. They were like the Shaquille O'Neal's of that time, basically. Okay? And their cities were large and heavily fortified. All but two of the twelve spies then reasoned, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. That's uh, Numbers 13.31. Now, again, wait a minute here. <laughs> wait a minute. God had just delivered these people from the powerhouse nation of that time. He just delivered them from Egypt. Egypt was the world power. Okay? And these are cities that they're coming uh, uh, in to take over that they're spying. They're not spying a nation. They're spying cities. And all of a sudden, God can't save them from these cities. 
all of a sudden, God is not able to get them into the land because his people are stronger than them. Again, I mean, you know, and we can look at it and go, how ridiculous, but, you know, still, we're the same way. You know, like, people, are you serious? God just did this, you know, to this greater people than, the, than these people here. These, these people in these lands, they weren't even considered world powerhouses. Egypt was the major player. Egypt was the major player of the day, and God can't do the cities. Like, okay, I, I don't get that. Now, remember, remember that one of the tenets of moralistic therapeutic deism is that God wants us to feel happy. God wants us to be happy all the time. So, when we encounter a situation that doesn't make us happy, we either conclude that it is not God or that God suddenly is not good anymore. Now we have to ask ourselves here again, what makes us doubt God's power and ability to bring about His intended will in our own lives? We have to ask that question. What circumstances, you know, what are the things that come up that all of a sudden, well, I'm not too sure if God can do it. Is it the election? Oh yeah, I said it. <laughs> yeah, I had to say it. You know, but what is it? You know, what circumstance does it take or would it take that would have us doubt God's power? What fear? You know, is it lack of material things? Is it lack of someone special? Is it the constant rejection of people? Is it the, the inability to, to just seem to get ahead in life? You know, what circumstances do we find ourselves in that tempt us to doubt that God is able to show His goodness to us, that God is able to fulfill His promises toward us? And now we come to Numbers 14. After the report of the spies, after it's been brought back, the people, they grumble yet again, and they question God's purposes. So first they question His provision, then His power, and now they're questioning His purposes. Again, so listen to their complaint in verses 1 through 3. Numbers 14. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land? To fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land? What is God doing? Why has He brought me here? You've heard it, okay? I've heard it. Uh, you know, maybe I've even said it, you know, God, why did you even make me? God, why did you even bother making me today? You think of Job, he said it. God, with all that's been going on in my life, you know, I don't feel good, I don't feel happy, I'm not, I'm, I don't feel like I'm where I'm supposed to be. What is your will in my life? Like, did you just raise me to, you know, my your little pawn? Did you just raise me to humiliate me? What is your purpose in my life? What are you doing? Now the problem, their problem was not that they didn't know God's purposes. They knew them. I mean, God had made them explicit. He told them, I brought you out so that you could be my treasured people. He told them that in Exodus 19. And he's telling them everything. And he's told them his purpose is, I want you guys to be holy. That's where you're going to find your happiness, is, is, is in your holiness, in your worship of me, in your service of me. So it's not like they didn't know them. They were to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But our hearts, our hearts are very fickle things. They forget quickly the good deeds and the word of God. We forget quickly. The people, they've been promised good things, but the only thing that is real to them right now is their suffering. Suffering has that kind of power, doesn't it? Suffering can change perspective in life very, very quickly. It has power to blind the eyes of faith. In another instance, right on the verge of the promised land, again, near the end of their uh, wilderness period, the people again, they presume on the protection of God. And this is, uh, I didn't read this portion, but Numbers... Uh, uh, at the end of Numbers 14, basically, God, he, he, he lets them out with their, he deals out their judgment. He says, you know, I, this generation I'm not going to deal with. I'm going to let them pass away. I'm going to raise up a new generation. And they, they kindly, ba they basically just say, okay, okay, you know, we'll go into the land. We'll do it. You know, we'll do what you tell us to now, God. You know, you can almost see them kind of crying like, 
maybe a child who's just been spanked and they're like, okay, okay, you know, I'll do it, I'll do it. You know, and these people, they, they decide to go up into battle and Moses tells them, God tells them, he's like, no, tell them not to go. I'm not, I'm not going to be with them. <laughs> I'm not going to be with them. And they go and they get defeated. Um, you know, they suffer a crippling defeat at the hand of the Canaanites. They had presumed upon God's protection while they were in a state of unbelief. I don't want to. I don't want to belabor the fallings of Israel, but we see uh, the last one in Numbers uh, 21, when the new generation. Okay, so here now the new generation. They're on the verge of entering the Promised Land, and Numbers 21, 4 through 5, it records that the people that they became impatient. The people, and it explicitly says they became impatient. And they wanted their promised land now, and they cried out again, uh, complaining about the quote-unquote worthless food that they had to eat. In our passage in Numbers 14, I know I'm having you guys jump around so much. That's why I said to read Numbers 11 through 21. <laughs> but in our passage here in Numbers 14, God's finally had it. He's had it with, you know, with the people of Israel. And he just he, he tells them, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, fine, I will pardon them, ultimately. Okay, but he pronounces a tingling judgment upon the people of Israel. And I'll read it again because it is, it is, it's chilling. Then the Lord said, he says, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, and God lives forever, <laughs> and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, there's a glorious promise in there still, but he says, none of the men who have seen my glory, the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt, and in the wilderness, and have yet put me to the test these ten times, and have not obeyed my voice, shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers. None of those who despised me shall see it. That is very tingling. If that doesn't send chills down your back, I don't know what else. <laughs> okay? I don't know what else. But it, it, it's, a, it's a very chilling pronouncement. Now, what is the meaning of the wilderness? What is the meaning of the wilderness? The wilderness was a trying place for the people of Israel. It was a place where God allowed a certain kind of suffering to come upon the people of Israel. It was not a suffering for sin, but rather a suffering because of sin, because of a particular kind of sin, because of their idolatry, because of their idolatry. You see, the people of Israel, though they had... They'd seen the miracles, they'd seen the signs, they'd seen the wonders, they'd seen the provision, they'd seen the power, they'd seen the protection, they'd seen all these things from God. Okay? Yet they still carried their idols. They still worshipped their idols. They still made an idol while Moses was receiving God's law. They still kept them. Now, I don't mean that each one of them basically carried around this little statue with them that they all bowed down to and, and, and worship, okay? Uh, but in their hearts, they were bowing down to things. They were bowing down to things in their heart. Now, the idols they carried, uh, if you turn to 1 Corinthians, uh, the New Testament is explicit on this understanding, that is on that interpretation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13, this is what it says, and this is basically, this is Paul's commentary on the book of Numbers. Okay? So this is an apostolic commentary. We're so privileged to have that. Paul says this, he says, For I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. That's another place where you can see Jesus in the Old Testament when Moses struck the rock. Uh, he struck it with the rod of judgment. It says that God stood upon, that uh, God was going to stand upon the rock. And when Moses struck the rock and God being identified with the rock, Moses was actually judging God so that uh, uh, water could be given to the people. There's a nice really little image of the cross. Jesus taking the judgment so that the people could have life. They could have life-giving water. So, uh, the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. There is the command. There is what we're supposed to take away from the wilderness period. 
He says it plainly. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's referring back to Exodus 32. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. There's Numbers 21. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. That's us. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So, look at what the Apostle Paul just did here. The Apostle explicitly connected the wilderness account in Numbers to our lives as Christians and as warnings to Christians against idolatry. Now, idols. Okay, we need to talk about idols. Because what are idols? Okay, uh, again, I don't mean just statues that we carry around that we bow down to and worship. Is that an idol? Yes, that is an idol. Okay, if you carry a little statue, or if you go to some place and they have a statue of of, of, of Buddha or, or whoever, uh, Vishnu, Krishna, you know, all the Hindu gods and stuff like that. Yes, that is very explicit idolatry. Very explicit. Okay, anything you bow the knee to, that is. Idolatry. But idols are a bit more subtle. In Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, there's a part, I believe, in chapter 11 or maybe in chapter 8, where when God, he takes Ezekiel and he's taking him into the temple and he's showing him all the horrible things that the priests are doing. And all of a sudden he says, I'll show you something worse. See the idols? They've taken the idols into their heart. And so the priests in the temple, they weren't, they didn't take uh, statues, you know, put them in the temple. It's, it says the priests, they've taken them into their heart. There is such a thing as heart idolatry. Okay, one of the Puritans, David Clark, he has a sermon called, uh, I believe, uh, the, something, the danger of soul idolatry is what he called it. I don't remember the full name, but soul idolatry. You see, an idol is anything that you desire more than you desire God. Anything that you desire more than you desire God, an idol is anything that you give more love, more affection, more time, more energy, more money, and service to more than God. I don't mean paying rent. Paying rent is not an idol, okay? Let's, let's be clear about that, okay? Let's be clear about that, okay? Uh, listen, to, listen to these statements uh, from various theologians throughout the centuries. Uh, this is from the Heidelberg Catechism, question 95. This was written about, uh, the, I believe, the mid-1500s. Uh, it says this, Idolatry is having or inventing something in, in which one trusts in place of or alongside of the only true God who has revealed himself in his word. Making up your own God. Making up your own view of God. Okay, that is also idolatry. When you, when you go back to Exodus 32, the paradigm example of idolatry for the rest of the Bible, okay, and the Bible's always making explicit reference to Exodus 32. When you read First and Second Samuel, First Chronicles, it always talks about the sin of Jeroboam, the calf. What's the calf referring to? Exodus 32, all the time, Exodus 32. Okay, um, they called that calf Yahweh. They didn't say Baal. They said, this be thy gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. They had identified that calf with Yahweh, with the one true God. They had made up their own image of who God was. This is uh, from Martin Luther's larger catechism. Uh, he says, a god, a god means that, uh, that from which we are to expect all good and to which we are to take refuge in all distress, so that to have a god is nothing else than to trust and believe him from the whole heart. That now I say upon which you set your heart and put your trust is properly your God. Okay? That which you put, or that's what you set your heart and put your trust is properly your God. In, in light of the elections, we have to say it, some people's God is the state. Some people's God is the government. That which you're putting all your hope and trust to be your provider, to be your savior, to give you, you know, to fulfill all your dreams in life and stuff like that, and to, to, uh, from which you're going to derive your ultimate happiness, that is your God. 
G.K. Beale, he said this, he said, whatever your heart clings or relies on for ultimate security. Okay? Whatever your heart clings to uh, or relies on for ultimate security that isn't God is an idol. Tim Keller, because I haven't quoted him in a long time, he says, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, anything you seek to give, uh, to give you what only God can give you. So something, you know, uh, and again, going kind of back to moralistic therapeutic deism, God is the one who gives us happiness because he's designed us. So to try to look for our happiness ultimately in something outside of God is to look for it in an idol. Quoting Keller again, this is from his book, Counterfeit Gods. Um, he says, a counterfeit God is anything so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. An idol is whatever you look to and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then I'll feel my life has meaning. Then I'll know that I have value and I'll feel significant and secure. And one last quote. This is from D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Uh, he said this, An idol is anything or anyone in my life that preoccupies the place in my life that should be preoccupied by God alone. Anything that holds such a controlling position in my life that it moves, it arouses, and attracts me so easily that I give my time, my attention, and energy and money to effortlessly. Whoever or whatever we give central value to in our lives, what you govern your life around. Be careful what you build your life on. Be careful. Now, you might be thinking, uh, why is the sermon uh, going to idolatry from suffering? Okay, well, you see... God uses suffering for Christians to expose the idols of our hearts that we still carry with us and that we still rely on and worship deep in our hearts. Yes, even as Christians, we still have idols. If Paul is warning the Corinthians okay, that the things in Numbers were written uh, uh, as an example uh, for them and instruction for us, we still have to be careful about idols in our own hearts. God uses trials to expose these idols and to reveal them to us so that we can be saved from them. You see, the judgment upon the idolaters in the Bible is basically this. Uh, in Psalm 115, verses 4 through 8, and in Psalm 135, verses 15 through 18, after describing these idols as, as uh, what G.K. Beale calls sensory malfunctory language, that they have eyes but cannot see, mouths but cannot speak, ears but cannot hear, okay, They're, the sense organs are malfunctioning, okay, uh, those are idols. And then he says this, he says, you become what you worship. You become what you worship. You be Because we are made in the image of God, we are meant to reflect that which we worship. When the fall happened, we basically, the light that's coming from God, we turned our reflective properties away from God and we reflect anything around us. When we reflect those things, we become those things. We start to become those things. And so on, on, on another note, the worship of God changes us. We become more holy. We become more godly. We become like what we're worshiping. For better or for worse, we, you become what it is that you worship. If you worship, uh, 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 let me go on here. Uh, that is to say, what we worship is what we reflect in our personality and our character and our actions. Okay, all, all those things about us, they're reflections of what it is that we worship. Okay, so if I were to suddenly start talking like Clint Eastwood, because Clint Eastwood was obviously my idol then. Okay, he wasn't, but if I were to do that, okay, you could tell in, in one sense, what, you could tell what's in my heart. Okay, when we imitate things, you can tell what's in our heart. When God pronounces his judgment on idolatry in the Bible, the people are usually given over to be like what they are worshipping. Okay, the Bible will use the sense like uh, they were handed over. God sold them into the hands of. Okay, God is judicially hardening the people. For example, in Exodus 32, when the people worship the golden calf as the Lord, God calls them stiff-necked, okay? You know where that language comes from? When a calf, okay, when it doesn't want to move, okay, and you're, you're tugging at it, and it gets stiff-necked, and it just fights you like that, and you're pulling it, and it's like, ah, you can't pull it. That's what God described the people as, because they had become like a calf, okay? They have turned aside. You gotta, it's funny, you've got to look at the language in Exodus 32, but they have turned aside, it's like cattle turning aside, veering off the path. Okay, uh, Their sin was de uh, described as having broken loose. 
like cattle, escaped from a, 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 from a fenced area or from a protective area of sorts. They've gone out. They, they, they've broken loose. They had become like what they worshipped. And you look at the language, okay? They, they ate, they, uh, they drank, and they rose up. Okay? Kind of like, like an animal in a sense. Eat, drink, reproduce. That's it. <laughs> that was all that their life was like. And, and the people had become just like what it is that they had worshipped in the golden calf. In Isaiah 1... The people were using oak trees to make their idols, which uh, uh, Isaiah says, which can neither see, nor hear, nor smell. Okay, now again, those are always interesting descriptions of idols, okay, in a sensory malfunctory language. Okay, uh, G.K. Bill talks about that in his book, We Become What We Worship. And he goes through many texts to really prove that. But when you follow Isaiah from Isaiah 1 and you follow to Isaiah 6, okay, in Isaiah 6, when God gives Isaiah his ministry, it is a ministry of judgment upon the people of Israel. It is a ministry of judgment, and the people are given over to this, to these words. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. God, His judgment in Isaiah 6 was, you want to worship those idols that have eyes but can't see, that have ears but can't hear? I'm going to make you become like them. And God hardened the people of Israel through the ministry of Isaiah. He had given them over to become like what it was that they were worshiping. Now, let me try and kind of bring this back around. Hopefully I haven't gone off on a rabbit trail. Okay. Uh, uh, think, about, think about the common source of critique against God in all of the grumblings and the complaints against God in the wilderness. Okay. Here are the words. If only we were back in Egypt. How many times did the people say that? We heard it in Exodus. Okay. We're hearing it in Numbers again. Oh, that we were back in Egypt. Remember the good old days of working in the hot baking sun, and making bricks and coming home dirty. But gosh darn it, there was meat. There was onions, garlics, and leeks. What are leeks? Does anybody even know? I don't know what leeks are. Okay. Whatever it is, you'll have to explain to me what leeks are, or maybe I know and call them by a different name. But uh, listen, Egypt, Egypt and its comforts were the idol of the people. Egypt and its comforts, they were the idol of the people. Now, in one of the final episodes of the grumblings in Numbers 21, God sends the people fiery serpents of judgment. That's Numbers 21, 6. Why serpents? Why serpents? This is interesting. I, 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 when I found this, I was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. But uh, the pharaohs of Egypt the pharaohs of Egypt, and you can look on, on some of their, I think, like the Middle Kingdom eras or something like that, but they started to wear basically a serpent that would come out on the crown uh, up here. Okay, and that was the sign of rule for the pharaoh. He had the serpent. He had the staff. It was, what was the staff? It was the serpent. Okay? So, what is he doing? What is God doing? Why does he send fiery serpents? Because God, in sending serpents, this was God's way of handing the people over to the symbol of the ruler that they desired and he did it for their ruin. He did it for their ruin. Now, how does this apply to us? As Christians, we too, we are in a sort of wilderness in which we are being tested and our hearts are constantly being revealed. Okay, What Martin Luther said was true. All life is repentance. Why? Because all of life shows us something that we need to get rid of. It shows an idol that we need to turn away from, an idol that we need to repent of. Now, the Israelites, they wanted... Uh, they wanted God to serve their own needs and their own desires. And when he wouldn't or didn't, they began to complain against God, to grumble against him, and to doubt his goodness, his kindness, his protection, and many other things. Now, we still do the same thing today. God, I've been serving you all these many years, and you still can't give me a spouse? Are you serious? <sighs> what else do you want me to do for you? Come on, God, just tell me. Tell me. I'll do it. Whatever. Just tell me what needs to get done. God, here's one. God, I, I, all I've asked is that you let me have a happy life and I will worship you, go to church for you, and even sing a few hymns. But how could you let my husband or my wife walk out on me? That's all I asked. How, and how could you let that happen in my life? Why? God, I've served you for, uh, for these last few months, and how could you let Obama win? 
I know, I have to throw in my election gigs in here. <laughs> but don't we do that? Don't we do that? Don't we complain against God? You know, sometimes it might not be the language that comes out of our mouth, but it sure is the language that our hearts speak a lot. It's the language that our hearts speak. It's like, God, you know, this is, this is the me campaign, and you're either on or you're off. You know, when God's not on, boy, we complain against Him, and we grumble. God, why can't I just be perfectly holy now? God, why can't I have the peace and the security of financial wealth right now? Why do I have to work for so long? Why, you know, and we don't have to say it again that way. Again, our hearts, they speak loud, and people who hang around us long enough know what we complain about most in life. Often our complaints are revealed in our longings and desires, uh, just like they were in the people of Israel. God, how come we Christians, uh, you know, here's one for a lot of singles, you know, God, how come we Christians can't just have sex and be happy like everybody else in the world? Why do we have to follow your, your sexual ethics? Why do we have to follow your code? Everybody else is doing it and they're happy. What's the deal, God? Everybody warns us, or I'm sorry, Scripture warns us to be careful about hardening our hearts through bitterness. And rest assured, the complaints do lead to bitterness. They do. Psalm 95, it says this. It says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massah in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and they put me to the proof, though they had seen my work, for 40 years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who go astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. The same passage of Scripture, it's applied to Christians in the letter of Hebrews. The Hebrews are considering returning to Judaism to avoid the suffering and persecution for being Christian. Okay, They're like, being Christian is really hard right now because the Roman, uh, the Roman uh, government doesn't like us, and Jews don't like us, and Jews are killing us as, as much as the Romans are. So I think I'll go back to being a Jew, because at least the Romans aren't persecuting the Jews. Okay? In Hebrews uh, 3, uh, 3, actually, chapter 3, verses 4 through 13, it uses this passage. Basically, Hebrews 3, verses, uh, chapter 3 through 4, 13, is actually a, a, an apostolic explanation of that passage of Psalm 95. And he uses it uh, to encourage Christians to persevere as Christians in their faith, even through the suffering. You see, there are some Christians who are not willing to suffer in this life in order to be Christian. Rather, they have uh, what might be called an over-realized eschatology, in which they think and live as if all the material blessings of God should be theirs right now. And you hear them on TV. Okay, you hear them all the time. Okay, your best life right now, you know, uh, health and wealth, uh, how much God wants you to be happy. And I keep reading these horrible Facebook posts from this one preacher. And, you know, it's like God has the best in store for you. He's just waiting for you to, to get on board. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, and, and, you know, God wants to fulfill all your dreams. And I'm like, whoa, 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 who's, in, who's God here if, that, if, that, if that's the God that you're promoting? You know, it's like God has so many plans. He doesn't have one plan. God is the one who's jumping on board everybody's plan, according to that sort of view. So the problem with that sort of presentation of God, uh, well, it, it's all a lie, okay? <laughs> God's plan is that God wants to make us holy. That is His plan. We just saw it, you know, uh, uh, those of you that were with us in our sermon on Leviticus last week, th there was the command, be holy, for I am holy. That's God's plan. What usually happens with the word happy is uh, that we insert our idols for what it means to be happy, and we'll say things like, well, if God wants me happy, then it must mean that God wants me to have that life of ease and comfort with a good retirement, with my good 401k plan, or, or whatever it is. And now, uh, God simply becomes a means to accomplishing our real goals, and we ask Him to serve our own agenda or to get out of the way. Even salvation can be our agenda. I remember being a member of a church committee once in, uh, in which a lifelong member, and I mean really a lifelong member, okay, he flat out said it, and nobody seemed to disagree with it, okay, uh, but he flat out uh, basically said why he was serving the church the way he was. He said, I'm serving in as many committees as I can because I want to make sure that I go to heaven. That was his ticket into heaven, was how much serving he was doing. Serving God was not his goal. Him getting to heaven was. God was just something that he used to try to get himself there. God was not his center. 
my friends, when God brings suffering into your life, it's because He's trying to show you that there are still idols lodged in your heart, and we need to address them. We need to address them. When suffering happens, man, we need to examine the attitude. What am I complaining about right now? What's missing? You know, and sometimes there is genuine hurt. That, I mean, you, just, you can't say it's because of an idol. There's just sometimes real human pain and sadness. Sometimes there's genuine human pain and sadness. But other times, you know, when we, you know, when we feel like we're suffering because of what we're missing, especially ask, what idol am I serving right now? What idol am I serving right now? The suffering that we go through is meant to call us into deeper faith and into more constant communion with God as our Savior. As our Savior. You see, because these Israelites in the wilderness, they wanted to treat God basically as if God was his, their, their butler. Okay? God, we want some meat. Can we get some meat here? Can I get a ribeye? Can I get that uh, medium rare, please? Thank you. Okay? That was basically how they treated God. That's how they did it. You know? Um, can, I get a, can I get some fruit? Can I get a nice cold glass of water? About 34 degrees would be fine. God, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, hey God, this food that you've made for us is really, really terrible. Where did you learn how to cook? What is this? Bread, manna? What is this? What, what is this stuff? <sighs> you know, this is bah, just nothing like the steak I had in Egypt. Remember that one steakhouse? Pharaoh's place? There's a real good meat there. <laughs> Now, everybody has their own idols that we all need to deal with. Again, here, it could be relationships, okay? could be pleasures of various kinds. could be job, career. could be power, uh, political cause, social cause. Uh, any sort of ism basically can function as an idol. It could be a particular religion or a particular expression of a religion. It could even be ministry. It could even be ministry. It could even be a spiritual gift. It could even be truth. And that basically sounds like, you know, my life has value or, quote-unquote, I only have significance when I am right. That can be an idol. Truth can be an idol if you wield it the wrong way. Whatever it is, God wants you to know that it's there and that it needs to come out. It needs to be addressed basically so that we can serve God without grumbling. So that we can really love God and not just the things of God. So that we can be His treasured possession above all the peoples of the earth. So that we can actually fulfill the first commandment to not have any other gods before the Lord. So that we can love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now, final point. We're all in the wilderness in some ways. All of us carry idols with us even after, uh, even after being redeemed. We still look to the cross and we still serve things. We still serve idols. We all have a promised land before us, just like the people of Israel. We all have great and wonderful promises that have been made uh, and a great and glorious city that we are looking forward to. But, but we're still in the wilderness. We're still in the wilderness. We're not there yet. In Revelation 12, 6, the author symbolically portrays the church as a woman who fled into the wilderness. That's the church. That's our time period right now. The wilderness, it's a trying time. It's a tough time. It really is. It's a place where we undergo the Lord's discipline. It's a place of trial. It's a place of temptation. How can we face it? Because again, I can give you guys just, you know, don't do this, don't have idols. And I can give you the law. And I can give you commands. But you know that's not going to be enough. I mean, just listening to, you know, to don't serve idols, we all feel that conviction right away. We all feel that conviction because we know we all do. We know we all do. So where is our hope? What hope do we have? Here is our hope. Our hope is in the true Israelite who went through the true wilderness for us. Jesus Christ, He is the true Israel of God. He faced the wilderness in its fullness and He conquered it. Follow me here. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is presented as the true and better Israel. There's a passage in, um, or let me just go through it here. First of all, let's, if you want to flip through the Gospel of Matthew, this is a really cool thing. But in the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus is presented as the, the true and better Israel, look in what ways, okay? He is what Israel should have been but failed to be for us. Now, let me show you what I mean, okay? In the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 1, the genealogy. The genealogy presented there establishes Jesus as an Israelite 
tracing his lineage from Abraham through the Davidic line, which would secure him as a true Israelite. Okay, Jesus is really a true Israelite. In Matthew chapter 2, we see that Jesus fled to Egypt, and he remained there for some time until Herod had passed away. Now, it's funny, but uh, Hosea 11.1 1 is quoted in there. In Matthew two, and, uh, or, yeah, in Matthew two, and it says, uh, uh, "It says, out of Egypt I called my son." Okay, think about that. Okay, Jesus is Israel. Jesus is Israel coming out of Egypt. So do you see? Do you see the trace? You've got the formation of the people of Israel in a sense in Jesus. Jesus went to Egypt. Jesus was called out of out of uh, out of Egypt. Okay. Uh, Jesus, uh, uh, hence, is the true Son of God, the true firstborn that the people of Israel only pointed to. Now then in Matthew 3, I'm being very broad here, but if you know Matthew 3, you can, you can read it or just recall. In Matthew 3, Jesus goes through the waters of baptism even as the people of Israel pass through the waters of the Red Sea. Pretty interesting connections, huh? Jesus went through the water just like the people did. He went through the waters. Finally, in Matthew 4, Jesus is led into the wilderness even as the people of Israel were led into the wilderness. Jesus for 40 days, Israel for 40 years. Just as Israel experienced a lack of food and water in the desert, so did Jesus. In Matthew 4, 2-3, he went hungry. The Israelites, they were tempted to live a life of autonomy and independence of God. So was Jesus. Jesus had his direct temptation from Satan. Had his direct temptations from Satan. Yet, while Israel grumbled against God's lack of provision, Jesus found contentment and he found satisfaction living not merely on bread, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus, he faced the second temptation of presumed blessings and the third temptation of presumed protection, all with the word. Of God, you remember the temptations. Throw yourself off, you know. Uh, don't put the Lord to the test. That's how he faced it. On a grander scale, Jesus, Jesus left heaven itself to enter into our world of hardship and into temptation. In a sense, Jesus left heaven to to come down here to His wilderness. For Jesus, his entire existence here was like a wilderness, having left the joys and the comforts of heaven. Jesus, he lived out a perfectly obedient and holy life in the midst of this broken and idolatrous world, and he did it all not merely as an example. If Jesus only did that as an example, I'm serious, quit. Quit. If, if Jesus is just an example to follow, quit. Because none of us can live up to that example. None of us at all can live up to that example. We can't. I'll, I'll, I'll be the first one to jump ship. I'll, I'll tell you right now. Okay? But no, Jesus didn't come as just an example. He came as our substitute. He came as our substitute. He became for us what we should have been. He lived out the life that Israel in the desert should have lived out. And on the cross, on the cross, Jesus Christ, He entered the ultimate wasteland and the ultimate wilderness of sin. On the cross, Jesus Christ was cast the farthest that he had ever been from the Father, crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On the cross, Jesus Christ received the punishment that we all deserve for our failings in the wilderness so that we could reach the promised land that he so rightly deserves. In the wilderness, the Israelites came under God's judgment and were told uh, to behold the staff with the bronze snake that was lifted up if they wanted to live. On the cross, Jesus Christ was lifted up for all to see and for all to be healed. And Jesus said in John three fourteen and 15, He said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. My friends, this is, this is the buck of it all. Jesus went through the wilderness for you. Jesus went through the wilderness for you. He went through the real wilderness Jesus conquered all the temptations, all the lies, and all the sin that seeks to destroy you. Jesus did it all. All that he asks you to do is just what the people did in the desert. Look to him. 
believe in him. Don't trust anything else. When you get bitten by that serpent, where is your healing? You have to look back to Christ. You have to constantly look back at the cross and you need to see Jesus taking the judgment for you. That is the way that we live in the wilderness. That's the way that you have to live out this Christian life. The Christian life is not a one-time look of faith. It's any time that you get bitten by that serpent. You need to look to the cross. It has to be a constant gaze. And, and the verbs that, uh, that John uses in the Greek, they're present tense when he says they're the one who is believing. Not the one who has believed one time in the past, but the one who is believing, who's persisting in faith. It's a constant gaze. It's something that we continually have to do. We look to Jesus. We look to the gospel that Jesus did it all. That Jesus was the true Israelite. He was for you. He was for me what I couldn't be for God. Look to him and his sufficiency for all of your needs. In closing, moralistic therapeutic deism is an idol. It's a set of ideas of comfort and a life of ease that plenty of us carry around in our wilderness. Where do we go for comfort? Where do we go? Is it, is it, uh, is it a pill? You know, what do we use as our escape from reality? Is it alcohol? Is it a hobby? Is it food? Is it pleasure? They just legalized marijuana. There's another one uh, in some states. You know, but in a sense, where do we turn to to find our rest that falls short of the promised rest that God has promised for us? In the wilderness, your heart will not know rest until it finds Christ. Until Jesus is your all, you will only have nothing but bitterness and grumbling. Find rest. Find rest. Find Christ. In Revelation 12.6, the Bible says that the woman who fled into the wilderness was sent to a place prepared by God. That place is Christ. That's our new tabernacle in the desert. It is in Christ that we find our nourishment. And so we go to Him. We have to seek Him daily. Seek Him in Scripture. Seek Him in the Lord's Supper. Seek Him in prayer. Be satisfied in Him.